Radio. This podcast is called Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest get some secrets off their chest. You should listen. It's the best. Hello and welcome to Obsessed with Joseph Scrimshaw on Feral Audio. I am your host. I am still Joseph Scrimshaw. There's nothing I can do about it. This week's episode is full of wonder, deep thoughts about life, and Buzz Aldrin punching jerks. Because it is about space, with author, YouTuber, and space flight historian Amy Shira Title. As always, you also hear our co-producer Sarah Meyer interviewing random human beings around Los Angeles and seeing how they feel about space. Do they think about space? Do they want to visit other planets? Can they look at the stars without humming music from Star Wars? We will find out. But first, I'd like to apologize. I could stop that sentence right there. I'd always like to apologize. It just feels good because I'm full of shame. Specifically, though, I'd like to apologize to my fourth grade teacher, Mr. File, because I feel like I have let him down. He was a very kind, sensitive man who, for some reason, was convinced that we would eventually, as humans, live on the moon. Specifically, that I would live on the moon. He would often yell at us in class about it. He'd say to us students, in your lifetime, you will live on the moon. It was very aggressive, almost a threat. You can't multiply fractions? Well, you might need to when you live on the moon. You forgot to bring a fruit roll-up for snack time? Well, you might need fruit roll-ups when you live on the moon. You don't know how to conjugate verbs? Well, you might need to when you will have been living on the moon. So I had this absolutely drilled into me. I just assumed growing up, of course, humans will live on the moon. But now, it just seems like, why? I mean, what would be different? Would we behave better on the moon? Probably not. We'd just put a bunch of crappy strip malls up there. Right now, the moon would be littered with old, abandoned blockbuster videos that are probably being haunted by, like, moon ghosts. Now, if we actually did have the technology to live on the moon, I would want it to be a prison. I would want the moon to be a penal colony for people who are jerks on the internet. Like the minute you respond to a tweet or a YouTube video or an Instagram or an article with something awful, you would be teleported to the moon. Which brings up the thorny question of how you determine what a bad internet comment is. And to me, this is very easy. Basically, if you imagine saying your comment out loud to an actual human person, and their immediate natural response would be to punch you in the throat, then you're going to the fucking moon. Soon the moon would be full of trolls, and the only thing the moon trolls would be allowed to do is write Yelp reviews of the moon itself. All the reviews would be things like, this moon sucks dicks, and somehow the words moon, sucks, and dicks would all be misspelled. Anyway, My point is, I feel like I let Mr. File down because I do not live on the moon. I did nothing toward the goal of living on the moon. But the other prediction that Mr. File made about my life is that someday I would meet a nice woman who wanted to marry me. And I am very glad that that one came true, but still just a little bit bummed that Sarah and I didn't get married on the moon. Anyway, that's enough about me. Let's talk about me. If you enjoy Obsessed Podcasts, you can support us by becoming a backer on Patreon. For as little as one buck a month, you'll get access to our monthly patron-only bonus episodes of Obsessed if you are interested. Full info is on patreon.com slash Joseph Scrimshaw. Or you can support all of the artists on the Feral Audio Podcast Collective by shopping at Amazon through our portal, which does not lead to the moon, just to amazon.com. Just go to feralaudio.com, click the Support Our Artist button, and go buy anything on Amazon, and some of the money will go to supporting Feral Audio. It does not matter what you buy on Amazon. This week, I'm recommending you buy the first thing that pops up when you type space into Amazon's search function, which is a collector's edition DVD of the movie Space Jam. Or you could buy my guest Amy's awesome book, Breaking the Chains of Gravity. Shows! I do shows! I've got a couple of stand-up shows coming up here in Los Angeles, then I'll be a guest at the big geek convention Dragon Con. I'll be doing a bunch of shows at Dragon Con, including a live recording of Obsessed about horror movies with Cecil Baldwin and Trace Beaulieu. So if you're going to Dragon Con, check the app for info on those shows. Then, back in Los Angeles, my comedy game show about pop culture, Head Cannon with Hal Lublin, will return to Nerd Melt on Friday, September 9th. Then I'll be back in Minnesota in September for a new convention called the North Star Science Film Festival. For tickets and full info on all my shows, go to josephscrimshaw.com slash live dash shows. But for now, sit back, 
relax, get out your combination telescope and podcast listening device, gaze wistfully at poor little Pluto, and enjoy Amy Shira Title's obsession with space. Obsessed. Hello and welcome to Obsessed with me, Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm sitting in my home with a very cool person whose name I'm going to attempt to pronounce correctly and see how I do. Here we go. Amy Shira title? Oh my god, you nailed it. Really? Most people do not nail it. I get really weird, like, bastardization, bastardization, blah, 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 bastardizations, I can words, of my name <laughs> squished together. No one realizes that the middle name is a middle name, and okay. Shira to tell is the big one that I get. Really? Yep. Do you think people are just trying to be overly fancy? I don't know. I really don't know. The funny thing is there's, a, there's an, an astronaut, the commander of Apollo 7, who is Wally Shira. And everyone looks at me and sees my middle name and says, oh, you must be the granddaughter. And I say, sure, except that I spell and pronounce my name differently. <laughs> well, to be fair, I was prepared to try to say your name correctly because right. that was literally the first words that I ever heard out of your mouth was you correcting someone. <laughs> I forgot about that. We met very yeah. recently at Convergence, the big mm -hmm. convention in Minnesota that I go to every year, and you were a guest for the first time Yes, at this guest convention. of honor for the first time ever, which was a very interesting introduction to that whole world. Yeah, because you've never been to like a never geeky been to convention. Never a, a sci-fi like con, nothing like that yeah. before. So. so what was your general reaction to all that? It was awesome. I didn't really know what to expect. I knew it was going to be high, high levels of nerdery and geekery and sort of fandom that I, I don't really understand for science fiction, but that it was going to be people being so incredibly and amazingly true to themselves. And it was exactly that. And it was really amazing to see and to be a part of. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. can you tell people a little bit about who you are and what you do? My current job description, I guess, is that I am a space flight historian, which usually cool. gets the response of, what? Uh, to which I always say, yeah. Um, so I, I am a, an expert in air quotes because I have a very hard time thinking of myself as an expert um, in Apollo era history and technology and social things and kind of everything relating to the moon program. And that goes beyond that goes to the military programs, the pre-NASA history, the uh, policies that enacted all these things, um, which that is in itself is not a job. So the job part <laughs> then comes in in that I have a blog on popular science called Vintage Space. I've been doing it for almost six years. Um, and that spawned a YouTube channel that I've been doing pretty dedicated for a couple of years now. Um, and I also uh, write and host a daily science show for Discovery Channel, DNews. And uh, when you need somebody who can speak knowledgeably about the moon landing programs or general uh, 1960s science or anything it, on your documentary, I get that call to sit on a green screen for three hours and talk. Uh, I give talks, I do, you know, all the weird things that you think, I need a space historian for this. <laughs> if you don't want someone who is old enough to have seen the moon landing, you'll find me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a great tagline Diversity. for what you do. <laughs> you can just start with that. Yes, I, I really should. That's actually pretty succinct and funny. Are you looking for a young person who can talk about the moon landing? Pretty much. <laughs> yeah, it's really great when I watch those documentaries. It's all, and even like I hosted a, or I moderated a panel on space history at an event this year, and I look over and it's all these, it's like my bookshelf come to life and all these people that like, they're friends and they're people that I admire and they're all old enough to be my parents. Maybe not all of them, but it's just so funny to see like this huge generation gap and then there's me holding court with them and I'm like, this feels really weird, but I'll take it. Now, do you think there aren't other people your general age who are interested or is it just that you have like you landed on the moon you've stuck your flag in there of i am the historian i i think i i kind of fell into that sticking the flag and i am the historian thing there are definitely other people my age who are interested in it and who do work in it but a lot of them at least that i know are kind of in the academic world there's okay. a lot of them who are historians with the air and space museum or something um i somehow fell I mean really did fall into being someone that's more visible and I think that's really the only thing that makes me different is that you know I I'm on the internet and I'm more accessible right. to people whereas you're, you're gonna have to dig to find a PhD student somewhere who probably knows way more than I do about their own little minutia um, so there's people out there it's just that when you google I'm the one that comes up. Right. When you Google flight historian, when, not yeah. ancient. When you I, actually, if you Google Amy Space, I think I come up, which is Damn. actually pretty nuts. Yeah. Um, there's got to be at least 18 bands named Amy Space. If not, that would be a pretty good band name. Maybe that should be. No, I can't have. I can't have a band name after me. I'll, re, I'll revisit this one. But um, yeah, no, I think I really think it's just that I've I've struck a way. I figured out a way to do it in a in a way that's different. So it's not like I don't want to just, I mean, I was, I wasn't, I have an academic background. I, I have a master's and I didn't want to do a PhD because I didn't want to spend five years writing something about something I love and have five people read it and then have it die in a basement in a university somewhere. Yeah. I'm going to spend five years writing. I want 
5,000 people to read it. So I became a popular writer. And that is the difference is that I have taken these things and like, you know, like I do with these Apollo live tweets that I will maybe explain more for your listeners in a second, (laughs) Um, you know, breaking stuff down into a way that's more accessible for the average person as opposed to keeping it in what I call like the old boys club where it's just writing to talk amongst yourselves. I'm writing to share it with everybody. Right. And that's, that's not a path that a lot of people take. Yeah, and I think, mm, this is my bias, but there is certainly a lot of the, fuck yeah, I love science out there, where I think people love the idea of science, yes. but you actually know the history of space yeah. flight. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, there's there's a, lo- a lot of that fuck yeah science attitude is sort of the, like, the party science thing, where it's like, <laughs> fuck yeah science, I saw a video on BuzzFeed, so now I know all the science. It's like, <laughs> yeah, well... I've read a lot of science reports about this one phenomenon that happened on the moon. So let me talk to you in a little bit more detail. It's kind of that, you know, I I don't want to sound like a science snob or anything. Because, like, I don't have a science background. I'm, it's all my own history background. But, um, yeah, it's, it's going, it's going a little bit deeper, but still keeping that fuck yeah science rah rah attitude, vibe, and funness to it. Cool. Yeah. So, not surprisingly, when I asked you for obsessions, because, I mean, that's a cool career, <laughs> but I would have been happy if you're like, I want to talk about, like, My Little Pony or Batman or whatever. Yeah. But I emailed you and you're like, no, it's space. <laughs> <laughs> Is that how I sound in my emails? <laughs> no. Uh, no. No, it just space. it was just really clearly that usually when I send people yeah. an email, they're like, I don't know. Let me ask my friends. Let me ask people in my life if right. I, what my... What I'm really interested in, but you're like, no, it's it's really, it's, come on, it's space. It's probably space. I mean, there's, uh, there's other things that I could probably talk about for an hour. I mean, seasons one through eight of The Simpsons are probably good. <laughs> I, I do have a paper Simpsons wallet, which is really good for a grown-up to have. Um, you know, stuff like that, but nothing, there's nothing that I've spent as much time with as okay. space, so. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm just really lucky that I got to turn my passion into work, which yeah. is like, not a lot of people do it, and I'm so lucky, and so happy every day that I can wake up and just like, oh yeah, I get to nerd for a living. <laughs> <laughs> cool. So I'm going to ask you some stuff about space, yeah. about your personal obsession with space. Yeah. And you know, career stuff might come into it, but yeah. I'm more interested in how you feel about space. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so when did you get into space? What hooked you on saying, I'm really interested, yeah. not in general science, I'm not interested specifically in like the history of science, I'm interested in Space. Space. Uh, it's really too bad this is a podcast because I have a great visual for this. Uh, <laughs> so when I was seven, the tender age of seven, not much taller than I am now, um, <laughs> I did a school project on Venus. And I, I remember the story a bit differently. My mom tells me that my dad had shown me Venus when we were vacationing in the Virgin Islands that summer, or that March break, rather. Um, I feel like I was assigned it, but I, can't, I don't remember. I okay. was seven. But I was fascinated by the fact that there is this little dot of light that you can see without binoculars in the night sky and it's so bright you can pick it out but when you know what that is it's a planet that's roughly the size of the earth it's our neighbor but it orbits it rotates backwards and it is 800 degrees on the surface and it has no moons and it's like the earth turned inside out going backwards but it's the earth's twin because it's roughly the same size and to me that was like blowing my tiny seven-year-old mind i was like wait what? I just couldn't understand. And then, you know, of course, I got the little kids' first space books, you know, Scholastic okay. and stuff. And they did you know, a little two-page spread on the planets. I'm like, they're all so different. And there's so many of them. And of course, this is, you know, this is 90, I'm going to give away my age. This is 92. So we had just discovered the first exoplanets. So none of this was in the little kids' space book. This is just our solar system. And I was just like, it's so cool. And there's so much to do. And then there was a little two page on the moon and there was a little drawing of two cartoon astronauts on standing on the surface in front of a lunar module okay and i was just like wait what because i'm go from to there i'm yeah. from canada okay and we don't have nasa obviously not everybody and their grandfather works for the space agency so i'd never heard of the moon landing and all of a sudden i was like what people went to the moon how did you does, does canada hate the moon landing how <laughs> how does being canadian make it I think that it's you just, didn't hear about the moon landing. I think it's just like it's not something that my family is like super into. Like my dad watched it. I think my mom didn't. I mean, it's just not something that was like this was really neat. You so did your mom this. make the active choice? To she, be my like, mom, I don't want to watch the moon landing. That's think, American bullshit. <laughs> my mom. Well, my mom's actually American. She's oh, okay. how I have U.S. citizenship. She was living in Paris at the time, and I just think she was more concerned with you know I have just arrived in Paris. Baguettes and existential and, dread. Yeah, yes, of course. As opposed to you know trying to make a living in this beautiful artsy city that she'd been obsessed with for years. Yeah. And, okay. Cool. You know, not going to go find a TV to watch some science stuff that she wasn't necessarily super into. I, I don't know, but it's it was just not something that was around my house. So when okay. I learned about this, it was just like. 
I don't like, understand. Why have you been hiding this from me? I want to know how and why this happened. And like that was that was the moment. And I, I the visual I have is me giving my science presentation on Venus. <laughs> <laughs> little little red corduroy pants. It's pretty awesome. But awesome. Yeah. So awesome. that that's the moment. Okay. So you said when you got the books, you were fascinated by the number of planets and all the stuff to do. So this was this has always been my hang up and baggage about space stuff is I get really excited about the moon or planets, but then the narrative kicks in of I can't concentrate on the science because I'm too busy thinking about well, what if Martians live there? I wonder what they look like. So when you say there's so much to do, what in your little seven-year-old brain did you think I'm going to actively do about space? I don't know. Well, I mean, okay. Well, I mean, my my first thought was I want to go to there um, <laughs> because when you're seven and everybody tells you that you can do anything you want, I obviously want to be an astronaut. Right. And you're like, and I want to burn alive on Venus. Yeah. I just, I was like, I want to go there. I want to go and explore these things. I want to learn about it because what fascinated me was that there were, you know, just little bits of information, how different they were and how much there was to learn. And there was a little thing. This was, um, at the time, there was a Planet X, which was thought to be beyond Pluto and maybe sort of a theoretical thing. This is, you know, resurfaced hundreds of times since. Yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's for the Doctor Who story. It's yeah, Mondas. They yeah. can't it with a Cyberman. Yeah, <laughs> for, it's, uh, it's also uh, planet, planet Nine that Mike Brown recently found. And that's a whole, that's, yeah, that's, that's a whole issue. Pluto issue, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, just the idea that there was more things to discover and more things to learn was like, I want to somehow be a part of that. And I had no idea how to do that. Okay. I just knew that I wanted to go to there and I wanted to see the earth from space and I wanted to somehow find a way to be involved in that um and that didn't work uh I can't math uh I also am medically unfit to go into space sadly I broke my spine and stuff in a car accident so that's that's the minor things um so no one would send me but I also (laughs) Uh, breaking your spine is not a minor thing (laughs) no but I mean I can I can walk which is very very good um but it does mean that I have a lot of med I would not pass a physical to go into space but um I realized that what I was really fascinated by was the stories of the people who went there because when I was 10 Apollo 13 came out and I love Tom Hanks because big is the greatest movie ever um (laughs) so that like it was weirdly seeing Tom Hanks as Jim Lovell was like a way that I could understand the people that had gone to the moon and that was like hooked on the narrative yeah so that so for me it was very quickly wanting to know about the people who went to the moon okay and like when you know I was maybe 12 and we got Encarta on CD-ROM I would look up the astronauts and print out their biographies to learn about who they were because that's that seemed like my way to understand the moon landing was through the people that did it yeah so it very as much as i still wanted to somehow be involved in actual space science my real interest was always the narrative of understanding how the moon landing happened okay and it's one of those things that you know the surface presentation that you see is this like we choose to go to the moon one small step america rah but really it's way bigger and way more complicated and that like that's what keeps me interested in this because there's just more details to discover every day right you're learning the human story that maybe matches kind of your experience as a seven-year-old of why did people choose to go there what pressures yeah it's political pressures made it happen and made it not happen yeah it's it's so it's so complicated and so interesting and so many details and it's just like yeah it's that narrative that has kept me sort of fascinated by this specific time period as opposed to just like I mean, I, I am interested in all of space, but I'm more interested in, in unpacking those narratives and learning lessons from those narratives. Yeah, cool. So yeah. now when you say that you can't math, was that a, <laughs> was there a moment where somebody uh, pulled you aside and said, I'm sorry, all of your math is wrong. Actually, you can't math. Actually, well, not not quite that firmly. I kind of wish somebody had said that. <laughs> you can't math. Um, but no, I actually did kind of have that moment. So I... I guess, what are you, like 13 in the beginning of high school? Yeah. I was trying to get myself in a track to still follow engineering to somehow get into that proper science world. And for for my school, that meant I had to take a certain level of math and also physics to be able to have the prerequisites for college, yada, yada, yada. Um, I did not have the right – I was not good enough in math. And I seriously blame the fact that I had – what eight math teachers in grade nine okay because they kept either quitting or getting fired <laughs> it was not a good year and it's like every, defense of the dark arts teacher in harry was, potter yeah, like they it just was, they were cursed it was cursed i don't really know what was going on but like we had <laughs> so i went to a bilingual school so we had a, a french math teacher and an english math teacher the french math teacher was a religious jew from montreal teaching in toronto so he couldn't drive after sundown on shabbat so he had to leave <laughs> it's it's canada it's the winter it gets dark at like three o'clock so he was missing every 
every other math class. So okay. he lasted a month. Um, you know, 14-year-old boys are kind of horrible, and they actually gave our English math teacher a nervous breakdown. Even in Canada. Even the stereotypes in Canada. of nice Canadians Even break down when it comes Canada. to 14-year-old little assholes. Yep. It's, they're 14 year old assholes or 14 year old assholes everywhere apparently <laughs> so so we just had like a series of substitute teachers and temporary teachers that always restarted and I like I'm not great with math anyways because yeah. it's too abstract for me um so having that like an un- inconsistent teaching in that year where like you really need good foundations uh, kind of messed me up. And I was told that I just didn't have the grades to go into the level of math I needed to also take physics. So I wasn't allowed to take physics either. Okay. Because they thought that I, what they really wanted was for me to have good grades so that the school would look good for right. future students. Okay. Because snooty private school. Um, as opposed to you really want to do this, let's see how you do. Yeah, let's figure out how yeah. to make that happen Yeah, for let's you. let's try to actually understand how you learn and teach you in a way that makes sense to you is just like no, no no just take biology it's easier i hate dissecting things i find bodies <laughs> creepy my dad's a hematologist and the blood it just i can't so hematology yeah is, that's is, blood the, is blood yeah he's he's a blood specialist and it's just he's like blood is always changing it's so cool and i'm like and also you live surrounded by vials of blood <laughs> <laughs> you're creepy dad it's so you're weird. like dexter yeah. it's kind of cool but also like no nah, i can't so the bio so being stuck in biology and like super low math is just like i got nothing like i don't know what to do so it took me a really long time it wasn't until like my last year of college that i discovered like oh my god you can actually be an historian of science and you can do science without so having to math in that period where math had been blocked yeah by canadian asshole teachers yep and before you discovered the possibility of narrative did did you wrestle with how am i going to stay attached to this thing that's yeah. been important to me since i was seven yeah it was definitely this like well maybe maybe i'll write a book about it or something or like maybe i'll just watch movies about it all the time and just like <laughs> like it from a distance but also then you know be an artist or something yeah. um i mean i really had no idea like that was the only thing that i that i had liked consistently from childhood and i had no way to be involved in it yeah. Which was just really frustrating and upsetting. So it was just like, I don't know, maybe I'll just, it'll just be like that weird thing that I know stuff about. Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah. just like a, a so passion, a hobby. So it would have been like my, I would have been like a hobby armchair historian. Yeah, and now you're a publisher, yeah. which is pretty so, awesome. So yeah, <laughs> I'm way happier here <laughs> than I would be. Uh, yep. So if you could travel to space, if there was like a great technology that just teleports you, whatever... And, and any physical things weren't an issue. Math yeah. wasn't an issue. Yeah. Where would you want to go in space? Um, I'd, ew, there's so, so many places. <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of places, so many places. in space. Um, I, I mean, I would obviously like to go to the moon because I would like to see the Earth rise over the moon's horizon because that's just an image that everybody knows and right. it's beautiful. I've got a, co- a copy of that on my wall from Apollo 8 signed by five Apollo astronauts. It's just, yeah. I'd love to see that. And you could take a good selfie you of that. Could, you You're could, good at selfies. You could really take a good selfie. I'd have to bring my cat for the real, <laughs> really good selfie. What's your cat's uh, name? His, my, my cat's name is Pete Conrad after the commander of Apollo 12. <laughs> <laughs> I met Pete Conrad's widow uh, recently actually and she loved it. I was like oh, really did you say- Embarrassed. I, I was like, we're, we're just on the phone and we're chatting and she's lovely. And I was like, well, I don't know if I should tell you this. I'm a bit embarrassed, but I am sitting here staring at my cat who is named Pete Conrad because I'm such a huge fan of your late husband. And she's like, I love that. <laughs> it was so sweet. Oh, so great. I yeah, nerd win there. But um All right, so you so take moon, your cat Pete Conrad take, to take the moon for Pete a selfie. Conrad and I would go to the moon for a selfie. Um I would really like to go to uh Titan, Saturn's moon Titan. Okay. Um not only is it scientifically very interesting because it does have the right sort of akin to the primordial soup that maybe existed on earth before we had oxygen so there is kind of like a could that chemically be the right place for life to start i would be interested in that but also um how cool would it be to sit there and be able to watch saturn just with its giant rings hanging out oh, yeah. over there. Um, the Sirens of Titan. I, I know I don't do a lot of sci-fi, but Sirens of Titan is my favorite book. It's Vonnegut. Yeah. And he describes that sort of scene. And I've all like, I don't know why. I've always been like, oh, yeah, I kind of love this book because of that description. <laughs> Did you um, read it because it involved some space stuff? I, I picked it up one day. I, I've always liked Vonnegut. I had no reason to pick up Sirens of Titan one day, but I that was the book that hit me like a truck when I finished it. I just cried. Okay. I don't know. It's like you know when a book just hits you the right way. Oh yeah. That one just nailed me, and it's my it's just it's my favorite book. Yeah. Um, but I picked it up because I was like, I like Titan. I wonder what this one's about. I just <laughs> I had like all the Vonnegut and I was just like grabbing them from my dad's collection. Um, 
Yeah, and I would also really like to go to Triton, Neptune's moon. Okay. Because there is a theory that Neptune, or not Neptune, uh, Triton and Pluto were actually similar bodies that were orbiting together in the very early solar system. And as Neptune traveled out, it grabbed both of them in a different resonance, and it captured Triton as a moon, and Pluto actually orbits in resonance with Neptune. Okay. So if everything we are learning about Pluto as being the super active, distant, frozen body... If that applies to Triton, that would be so cool. So Pluto like, sounds like I... such an X when you describe it that way. <laughs> a very active, yeah. distant, frozen body. Yeah, that's, well, I mean, yes, okay. So you might have two bitchy ex-girlfriends way out there in the distant solar system. I think it'd be, I would I would like to see more about the ice giants just because I think okay. that they're, it's, it's beautiful and I'd love to, I, like, I want a mission out there and if I could somehow go, I would take it. Okay. So this next question is more about my yeah. obsession. Mm-hmm. Um, so you talked about reading Sirens of Titan. Yes. Not only because you liked Vonnegut, but because it was connected to space. And Vonnegut. I mean, Vonnegut. It was a little bit of both. A little bit of Vonnegut, <laughs> little, Vonnegut little space. I understand. Um, have you ever watched like Star Wars or Star Trek or stuff that spins narratively off of a fascination with space? Yeah. Um, I know. I don't sci-fi as much as people think I should or want me to. This is not a judgment. Um, I'm just no, curious. Well, thank you for not judging me. <laughs> um, I <laughs> Please have... come over to my house and let me judge you on a podcast. <laughs> uh, sigh. Um, I do I do own... My mom got me the original Star Wars trilogy when I was maybe 13. And I do I do really like it because it is a really good narrative. Um, it's it's a fun story. Yeah. I, I liked it enough to see the first episode when it came out and was so irritated by it that I haven't seen a Star Wars movie since. <laughs> um, yeah, I f- feel like that's the normal reaction. I There are a lot of people who yeah, feel that yep. way. Yeah, so I do. I mean, I do I do like Star Wars, but I it's not, it's, you know, no more than any other movie for me. Okay. Um, Star Trek, I tried a couple episodes, like, God, eight years ago, maybe. And okay. I just, like, I think it was The Next Generation, the one with, uh, oh, my God. You're Patrick making Stewart. a bald gesture? <laughs> Is that what <laughs> Sorry, that hand no, gesture was? Bald gesture. <laughs> Uh, Patrick Stewart. Patrick All Stewart. I can think of is uh, is Jean-Luc the uh, Picard. Jean-Luc Picard slash uh, director Bullock from <laughs> American Dad. That's all I can think of when I think of him. <laughs> uh, you I are alone in that. Yeah. And that being your first thought of Patrick Stewart. <laughs> I know. I know. American Dad is one of those shows that I put on when I'm doing chores. So. Okay. Um, yeah. So I, I just couldn't really get into it. Okay. Um, same with Doctor Who. I was talking actually to Shannon at uh, at Convergence about this, that I I can't remember. I watched the one with some blonde pop star who was the girl, and she told me that that was the worst possible season to start in. Oh, uh, Billy Piper. I think I can't remember her name. Uh, was she the was... doctor wearing a leather jacket? And do you have a Northern English accent? I don't know accent distinctions. I can't remember, but I just remember it being this blonde girl that it felt like it felt like she was way too young for there to be a romantic subtext, and it was a little oh, bit creepy. Yeah. And also, she was really irritating. I found her oh, okay. irritating as an actress. And Shannon was you... like, "You started at the wrong spot. You'd love it if you tried this doctor." And I was like, "Okay, maybe I'll give another." Go. Yeah, I think you probably watched David Tennant. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. So does this get uh, so, annoying? to have people ask if you like the media that a lot of people associate with space even though it's not what you you're interested in the real narrative of space and then there are made up narratives that happen in space yeah it's not it's not annoying so much as it makes me feel like i'm not nerding right oh Um, yeah yeah because it's sort of like I, th- I think it's it's hard for me to explain to people, I guess, that when you space all the time, it's not necessarily the case that I want to other space in my spare time. Okay. Um, you know, you you kind of need a break from it. You kind of need to let your brain reset. And if I'm watching a science fiction movie, and I, I mean, there are some sci-fi movies that I love. Have you seen Moon with, I think, Sam Rockwell? No, I haven't. Name? It's phenomenal. It's one of those, like, I'm a big fan of psychological thrillers and things okay. that are sort of more, more subtle in the way that they fuck with you. Uh, this was one of those movies that I wish I could watch it again for the first time because it was just very, like, quietly powerful. Um, that was great. Gravity, not not as much as my favorite. Um, you know, so there, there are things that I do see in that I do like. It's just that I don't necessarily want to be thinking like, oh yeah, why is there gravity on a spaceship that's not spinning right now? This is okay. annoying. So Stuff the like that. It's inaccurate just like, science does bug you. It does. It does bug me. And especially with, there are some shows like, I feel like this is going to be blasphemous to say, but Battlestar Galactica, I got like through the third season. Okay. And then I just, I never picked it up. Um, it was sort of like a show that didn't need to be happening in space to me. Like there was, it was all about personal relationships and politics and annoying things like that but somehow they just tried to like i felt like they were trying to shoehorn science into it but okay. wrong science that i was just sort of like i can't totally suspend my disbelief and none of these characters are likable enough for me so it wasn't even that it was that i can't like suspend my disbelief yeah. for the science fiction it was just like this isn't even 
a, a premise that I feel like I want to get okay. emotionally invested that in. That helps because it, it sounds like what you're saying is Battlestar Galactica was literally a waste of space. Like, if you're going to be in space, do some cool <laughs> space stuff. Yeah, I feel like, I mean, the the... I thought it was kind of, the whole, like, Cylon thing was kind of interesting, but I honestly felt like it was, there were episodes that's going on and on about, like, how to manage politics on all these ships, and I'm like, this is just way too big. Like, <laughs> like take on one thing. I know this show is, like, an institution for sci-fi fans going back, like, 40 years, but sort of, like, either be a space It wasn't show. that revered before. <laughs> before but, they rebooted maybe, it, it was. Maybe it's just, like, all my nerd friends just love it, but it's sort of, like, either be a space show or be a show about colonies, but, like, you're doing so many things, I just can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so speaking of your own sort of sci-fi narrative, if there were aliens, if there was other life, and they came to Earth, mm -hmm. what would you want them to be like? Do you ever have these kinds of fantasies? Um, the the closest... When, okay, when I think of aliens, I think there's probably, like microbial life somewhere so that's exciting. where my brain usually goes super exciting um actually it would be very exciting it would be. but when i think about aliens contacting us i mean i i think the the chances are so low that i have a hard time really getting into okay. that that headspace but i do like to think and this is the argument that i put forward um given how many science fiction movies there are where the aliens come and like enslave the earth or attack the earth or kill the earth i like the idea that that aliens are actually canadians and they're <laughs> sort of they're sort of standing there like should we should we go say hi i don't know i don't want to be a bother and they're just like really really shy and polite and courteous and they're just kind of waiting politely to see if maybe we signal to them first oh they're just waiting for an invitation <laughs> that they're they're just too like they feel really awkward they're just socially awkward because <laughs> that's how i feel <laughs> So yeah, it's I I like the idea that it's not necessarily that they want to enslave us. That maybe they they've seen us, but they just don't really know what to do about it. Okay, so you would like it if I think we kind of contacted funny. the socially awkward Canadian aliens. Yeah. They came to Earth, then we got together at a party, and we all just kind of looked at our phones, but didn't really interact. And that's sort of like a like a I mean I I almost imagine it. I think like a like a bad first date but like <laughs> like speed dating i've never done speed dating so i'm just imagining what it would be like where like you're you know you're face to face with an alien everybody at a table is face to face with an alien you've got like five minutes to kind of suss each other out a bit and be like well so where did you come from yeah, Wait, what's how your deal far is that what's your deal and then you're just you're really there's no no enslaving no violence no nothing you're just kind of curious to get to know these these new beings and stuff i don't really see why it always has to be so violent i think it could be more more scientific and interesting and yeah polite how would you feel <laughs> if the aliens showed up and they were giant cat creatures I'd be so cute <laughs> <laughs> i mean they would probably bat us around and kill us but it would be so cute. <laughs> Why do you you just went on a lovely speech about peaceful, nonviolent aliens? But and then I you assume even... if they're cats, they're gonna smack us around. Oh no, not around. not because not because they're cats. I mean, you've seen cats play with things. If oh, they're giant think... cats, like my cat does not know his own strength. He's like he'll knock something over and like break things. It's like you have no idea how <laughs> high up on a desk you are. I just imagine a giant cat would see you like on top of a parking garage and be like, "Oh, what's that? I want to play with that," and accidentally okay. knock you to your death. And he'd be like. The kitties would adorably wipe out humanity because they thought we were the cutest little things ever. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that makes sense. I My mind just went to a weird place. <laughs> no, no, it makes perfect sense. I said giant cats, imagining that they would be human sized because that would be oh. giant for cats. But then you took my oh, words sorry. I, literally, I was which thinking, is quite understandable. I was thinking like giant cats, yeah. Yeah, like 50 foot high kittens. Yeah, they would just, oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. Me. Like, Wouldn't I, it fun, be fun if I scratched this building and then they just knocked the yeah, whole damn thing yeah. over and we'd all die? If they're like human sized cats, I mean, Hopefully we could come to some symbiotic relationship where we could ride them around and also snuggle them, but also feed them and take care of them because that would be so cute. <laughs> now, would you name a giant cat Pete Conrad or what is the what is the appropriate uh, actual astronaut or space figure to name a giant cat? I mean, I would still go with Pete Conrad. He's still, I mean, he's the giant cat in my mind. <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, there, I mean, there are some good ones out there to, to name a cat after, I think. But, okay. you know, Pete Conrad's up there for me. Okay. We're definitely, uh, we're getting into the weird questions now, as you might yeah, be able to tell. Yeah, So this is my next sure. kind of weirder question. If you could have Buzz Aldrin punch anyone, who would you have Buzz Aldrin punch? <laughs> Oh, I have a list. <laughs> <laughs> Very you deep live, because you're you a live, Canadian. You live on the internet. You know how much 
the trolls suck. Okay. I have a list of trolls who I oh, who I will really? not name. I will not name. Yeah, you don't. Um, yeah, but you keep track of them. I do. Yes, do I do. You know have, their real names, or yes. is it their dumb handles? No, I do because um, so the world that I work in is largely older men, um, right. just by virtue of the fact that the moon landings happened in the sixties and seventies. So a lot of my a lot of my fans and a lot of my colleagues are men in their forties, fifties, sixties, seventies, and most of them are really lovely and happy to have a young woman involved to kind of carry the torch to the next generation. And a few of them really hate me. Really? Because, just for existing. Because I'm I'm a woman. I'm young. I wasn't there. How could I possibly speak with authority about anything that I didn't see? Oh, because I apparently can't read. Um, so I I do wow. have, I mean, these are people who are published. These are people who are known in the field that like, you know, I've I've worked with them and it's very awkward. Um, there's, there's a list of people that I know and I know they watch me. They've got Google alerts for me because of the way they react to me online. Like I can tell and it gets creepy and weird and scary. And yeah. they're, they're, on, they're, they're my list. I would like to just kind of scatter them in a room and let Buzz Aldrin run around and just kind of like punch, <laughs> backspin, kick, you know, back fist. Just go nuts. You lock them in a yeah. room and just Buzz Aldrin starts swinging his arms and says, if you walk into this, it's your if fault. You it's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, that really sucks. Um, yeah. not, not the Buzz Aldrin punching. That's great. Uh, <laughs> but you have professional trolls. I, I assume that you were just going to say like, well, I'm a woman on the internet, so hmm. I get all the normal dumb baggage. I mean, there's definitely that too. There's definitely people. I mean, the mansplaining is real. Oh my God. Oh. Um, I actually had someone mansplain at the, to me at the gym the other day how to do a pull-up. And I was just like, how is this happening everywhere in my life? Really? Uh, it was so, it was just like, okay, sure. Yeah. Goodbye. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, there's definitely those trolls, but I do have a handful of professional trolls that just don't want me taking their work. Oh, that really, really and sucks. I can, and I just, I don't, I don't get it. I'm not in their circles. I do things very differently because I, again, I write for the public, not for the, the academic world. So uh, most people are really lovely and want to help me learn and be better every day. And some people just want to tear you down. Yeah. So, and it's just, it's so funny when I think about it, I'm just like, these are, these are grown men with families. Yeah, it's really sad. That, That's the you know, sad part of the whole you, mansplaining thing. Yeah, for all the time you're spending writing articles about me, you could be actually doing something. Right, so but people, you're spending all of your time telling me why I should, why I can't do what I do, while I'm researching to do what I do. Yeah. Do you just not engage them? Yeah, I just don't. I. Yeah. I mean, I, I could, I could fight back. I could do any number of things, but like, I don't want to sink to that. I don't want to feed them. I don't want to waste my time. Yeah. So I think most that's of awesome. them, quite frankly, I just I mute them on Twitter. I don't even block them because I don't want them to see that as aggression. I just mute people and then I just don't have to see it. Muting's really, really fun. It's it feels good. It feels like you don't know how much I hate you. But yeah. I do. It's like <laughs> go scream into the abyss. Yes. And that's yeah. fine. It's nice. For you. It's nice. So this is a space history thing that uh, I just went to the Griffith Observatory the other day mm -hmm. with my in-laws nice. and we were talking about this and I was curious your space historian perspective. Neil Armstrong's quote the uh there's one small step for a man right <laughs> one giant leap for mankind how yeah. do you feel about the general controversy about whether or not he said the uh, uh is that do you is that a super controversial thing that is dangerous to speak about on comedy podcasts no i think it's one of those things that like why are we talking about this okay <laughs> it's sort of like um there's so i've i've read the apollo 11 transcript uh so, so for your listeners i do this thing where i live tweet apollo missions on their 45th anniversary so yeah. it's it's time stamped exactly when it happened plus 45 years so apollo 11 was two two years ago now yeah yeah. Um, so I've read the transcript and okay. there is a point of, I can't remember when exactly, but it's when they're on the way back from the moon and uh, Buzz Aldrin is talking to Capcom, whoever was on Capcom, um, about the quote, about the landing. They're kind of debriefing some stuff and he references the quote as one small step for a man. So that to me was kind of an interesting, because this controversy, quote unquote, had already been raised that like maybe it was a man and it is just a calm kind of glitch that you don't hear it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a good quote either way. Yeah. I think we can move on from that one now. <laughs> it's like it's like the day. So do you remember when uh, the Rosetta lander landed on the comet? No. Okay, so. I was probably watching Star Wars. That's fair. So see, this is why real space is so cool. The European Space Agency landed a, a little lander, uh, the Philae lander on comet P67, Russian name okay. that I can't pronounce. And it was awesome. It, they, on a comet, this tiny thing that's moving, it took 10 years. It was this insane trajectory. Oh, yeah. No, really, when did this happen? Like, oh, like two years ago? Okay, I remember everyone maybe? being fuck and yeah on Twitter. It was, it was amazing. It was awesome to watch. And 
one of the chief scientists, whose name escapes me right now, was wearing a shirt designed by a female friend of his with pinup girls in bondage. Oh, I remember that. And this now, yeah. I saw that and I was like, I actually thought it was a great shirt. Um, maybe not the most appropriate shirt to wear, but ultimately the guy just landed a lander on a comet. So let's talk about that. And Twitter exploded. It was all about Shirtgate. All the articles are about the shirt. It's just like, right. why are we really talking about this when we're just ignoring the science? And this is like, I mean, very different situation, but it's one of those things where like, we're getting hung up on a little detail and making it into something that it doesn't need to be because ultimately what matters is the big thing that just happened. Yeah. Let's, let's okay. stop fighting over the tiny little details. So for your interest in the, the narrative of space flight, Obviously, you are interested in, like you just said, the the big thing, the thing that matters, the discovery, the accomplishment, yeah. the awe-inspiring stuff. But in order to be interested in the narrative, you must be interested in, like, the human part of the story, yes. right? Yeah, absolutely. So what intrigues you the most about, like, the early, the, the early flights to the moon are, like, your main expertise, right? Mm -hmm. So what is the intriguing part of that human story? I think those astronauts have much more visible personalities than astronauts do now. Okay. Like, how many astronauts can the average person name? Like, Chris Hadfield, who hasn't been in space for a while, and right. Scott Kelly, who just went up for a year, but um, no one else really knows astronauts. In the 60s, they were household names. They were rock stars. Like, they, you know, the original seven had girls trying to bet each one of them. Okay. Uh, they... It was that was real. Um, they had such strong personalities, and they were flying. You know, every mission was historic at the time, so they were flying these things. They were in the newspaper everywhere, so you really had a sense of who they were and their interaction and their selves, yeah. which makes them really fun to talk about and really fun to trace. And like one of the reasons that I love uh, name my cat after the Commander Apollo Twelve is that mission still even like. Two months ago in Tucson, the command module pilot, Dick Gordon, talked on a, on a panel and said, the best thing about going to the moon for me was that I went with my two best friends. And you still see that interaction with him and okay. the leader module pilot, Albine. So you have these really strong personalities. And reading their transcript, you can see these personalities. It's like really, <laughs> like, they had three days of downtime. Like, what do you think they're going to do? They're going to fuck around a lot. All right. um, and it was really fun. And like, these guys were just like really entertaining personalities. I mean, a lot of them are deeply misogynistic because it's the 60s and they still are but ultimately they become they become caricatures almost that are so great to work with okay that you don't have that you know nasa controls the image and the message of its astronauts now like i interviewed the international space station last year and i, I talked to scott kelly and oh a, a an astronaut with a very German name that I can't remember because it was really hard to pronounce as it was. I had a cheat sheet in front of me. Um, and, and I, you know, I was trying to, trying to get them to kind of give me some, some real answers, but yeah, they were digging. really, really just towing NASA's line about the hashtag Drain to Mars. Um, and it was, you know, I get it because this is publicity, but they didn't do that in the sixties because people wanted to know the real them and you have more of that to work with right. when you're dealing with that era. So you just kind of can't get to the story behind it. You, you can, but it takes, I mean, I feel like the astronaut has to retire and write a book. Okay. I feel like they have to not be in space. I mean, you don't get, there is, I mean, and, and maybe it's just because I haven't taken the time to read any transcripts from the ISS, because yeah. frankly, I'm just not as personally interested in, in these okay. missions. But like, you know, you have hour-long conversations about whether you can eat tuna that's been open for eight hours. You don't necessarily have these kinds of mundane, but like really human episodes yeah, happening like in space, space now. Yeah. It really is. That was also on Apollo 12. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you have all these like really weird things where like they're listening to, to you know, little Spanish flea around the moon. Oh, wow. And like these little details that you're just like, I just want to paint this picture because this is so weird. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I understand not wanting people to get distracted by Shirtgate and ignore the amazing thing that just happened. Yeah. But isn't a thing like Shirtgate the kind of personality that you're craving that peek into humanity and maybe maybe that's a mistake yeah. publicity-wise, so, a flaw, it's human? So I think, okay, well, we'll take Shirtgate as an example because I think it's a good one. So instead of looking at the shirt and using it as a way to discuss the issues of gender imbalance in science, use it as a way to discuss the scientist's life outside of work to understand right. the whole person that he is because he i think i remember seeing pictures of him i think he's got full sleeve tattoos yeah and wearing the shirt and it's just like i really want to know what shows you go to on the weekends because i <laughs> feel like you'd be really fun to be in a pit with what bands are um, you into yeah, yeah i just feel like i want to know about the full person that created this amazing mission 
Okay. And that to me, like seeing the shirt, seeing those details about somebody's life should give you a fuller understanding of the science that they do, not be a point to discuss issues that are tangentially related to what this person has done. Yeah. So for me, so the, the whole like man versus a man with Neil Armstrong is just like, I'm more interested in how that quote came about. Because what does that say about Neil Armstrong as the person? How does that put him as like the ambassador from Earth who was the first on the moon? Like, what does that say as opposed to the detail of, well, was it a calm glitch or did he just say it wrong? It's like, yeah. well, let's, let's talk about why those were the words that he picked and how that came out. And yeah. that that to me is sort of unpacking backwards to him as opposed to the issue. Yeah, getting getting to sense. his soul. Um, Here is a more philosophical question for you. Oh, uh, <laughs> you can do it. I believe in you. Uh, about space. So, obviously, space is real big, mm. fast, endless. When you think about space that way in the sort of exploration and the just basically thinking about the vastness of space and how much we still don't know, does that make you feel more centered or does that make you feel like, oh, God, everything is meaningless? Um, A little from column A, a little from column B. <laughs> it depends on how much I've had to drink that night. <laughs> So when you're um, drunk, which way does it go? I have this moment on airplanes a lot when okay. you're like, you know, 35,000 feet in a sky tube looking out into nothing. It's just like I try to put myself in the headspace of someone, only three men have ever done an EVA between the Earth and the moon. And what is an EVA? E, uh, sorry, extravehicular activity or spacewalk. So they stepped outside halfway between the Earth and the moon, which can you oh. imagine looking up and you're a hundred and... and 20,000 miles yeah. from your two closest things, you're going 35,000 feet per second and only one of those things can support your life. Yeah. And also you're in a space suit and if that fails, you die. Um, and and I try to imagine myself in that situation Yeah. and just think, how would that feel? And it's a mix between this is so incredible that you're able to experience and understand how big this is yeah. and oh my God, we've created a society where money matters, but ultimately nothing matters. <laughs> it's like a mix between those. No, more than anything, it's sort of, it just fascinates me how much is out there and how much we do know, given that we can't go to these places, that it's all remote or done with, with robots. And it's just amazing what we've been able to uncover in a really short amount of time. Yeah. Yeah. So so it mostly makes you just feel excited awe, about the human yeah. journey. Yeah. And if you've had a little bit to drink. And then it's sort of like if you're in a, you know, having one of those days, you're just like, oh, God, none of this really matters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I ask partially from my own baggage because whenever I'm stressed, people say, like, go look at the ocean. Yeah. Go look at the stars. Like, it's something that makes me feel smaller. That's right. not helpful yeah. to me right now. To me, see, I, yeah. For me, the ocean feels like endless possibilities, like being yeah. able to not see horizons. It's just like all the things. I can do all the things. But that only happens in the daytime when you can like see the ocean. Looking yeah. out at the ocean when it's black, you know, and you're like on the pier beyond the lights, you're just like, oh my God, I could walk into nothingness and die. <laughs> <laughs> Fun. Yay. <laughs> existential crises. <laughs> Yay. There's some of my favorite things to think about is existential crises. Go team. Um, so... If you were going to, if you had to make up a science fiction story, yeah, and said that's based on on space exploration, what? So you you've got your own show. The world has come to you and said you were right. Battlestar yeah. Galactica sucked. <laughs> The you, show is Amy. called Battlestar Galactica <laughs> Sucked, comma, here's a better one. <laughs> yes. Catchiest title ever. <laughs> That's a great title. So what would happen on this? Where would it be hmm. Where would it be set? Oh my god, I have no idea. Um... It would be set on Titan, right? I mean... It, it would either be set... I mean, it would depend on, on whether you would want interactions with humans. Because you could set something interesting on Mars. Okay. Well, now I'm thinking, well, maybe it would be something on Mars, but it would be Mars like... I don't know, 10 million years ago or something, okay. when Mars had a heavier atmosphere and could actually, like, see, it has to be grounded in real science yeah, for me. Yeah, absolutely. But, like, you know, take take ancient Mars where it actually had surface water and had an atmosphere and, like, what happened with a society that popped up but ultimately was doomed in, like, four generations because that's how quickly the atmosphere bled off. Like, maybe that would be an interesting... Oh, maybe that would be interesting. Um, <laughs> what would happen if life evolved and got to a point of human humanoid things on yeah. Mars? But the the just dissipation of the atmosphere and destruction of the planet was so quick that you could see it generation by generation so happening. Do, and do you think that they would know? Do you think like the first generation on this show would know like we have four generations and then it's over? Maybe that'd be really interesting if we sort of like 
maybe it'd be like the second generation would start to figure it out. It'd be like the younger generation seeing like, oh yeah, well back in my day, it's like, yeah. well, why is that not happening now? And then like they're Martians, they're obviously smarter than us and have advanced technologies <laughs> because science fiction. Um, you know, they, they kind of figured out, they're like, oh my God, the rate this is going, we've got like maybe, maybe 50 years left before this planet is completely desiccated. All right, let's pop out all the babies and go to earth. And like, you know, they try to figure out, maybe it's like us in reverse, but on a much faster time scale. And like we, you know, flash forward humans land on Mars and find the remains of the society that just like didn't end up in a spot where any of the rovers have been. So okay. we missed it because uh, they like didn't awesome have show. a plan to go. They they just couldn't get far enough around the planet, and we haven't gone far enough around the planet to figure out that like yeah, we were there first. Yeah, that sounds yeah. awesome. And can they be yeah. cats? They could be cats, but then that wouldn't. But would they have? But they need to be. But they need to be humanoid, or else the viewer can't imagine themselves as the people, right? Oh, right, true. So they're cats with human eyes. <laughs> cats. And human that eyes. wouldn't be at all creepy. That would be so creepy. <laughs> I specialize in creepy. Yeah, well, you nailed it on that one. <laughs> or humans with cat eyes. Oh, that. That's that also great. really creepy. It's the, that's it's the slits. Yeah, it's, it's less creepy though. It is less creepy. If they didn't blink much, that would be fine. Do cats blink? Oh yeah. They blink, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking good care of Pete, right? You're... I am. I have to, have to take him to the vet tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Just for a checkup, not yeah. because he's sick. Let's yeah. be clear. Check on his blinking. Yeah. Ask the vet. He he winks a lot, actually. <laughs> and sitting in the desk, he's just like. <laughs> It's like a slow motion, lazy wink. It's just like, it's like I wanted to blink, but I got tired, so I just did it with one eye. <laughs> Do you ever time it, try, try to time it where you say something really interesting right when you think he's going to wink? No, but sometimes I try to match his winking, so I'll be like, <laughs> we'll be like lying around, just like petting him, and he'll be like super chill, and he'll be slow blinking, and I'll be like, <laughs> right there with him, and just like try to match his pace and like have a moment. <laughs> I'm totally normal, I promise. <laughs> What's your opinion of space? It's deep and vast. Um, how do you feel about space and space exploration? I'm not sure because, you know, space is it's very, very big. Limitless. Never ending. What do you think about space exploration? I'm for it. Would you want to be an astronaut? Yeah, no, that would be, that would be fun. Yeah. What would you take with you if you went into space? Um, my dog and... Um, I'm sure they would have all the things that I would want to take. Would you want to do it? Would you ever want to be an astronaut? It would be cool because I, I would like going to space, you know. It, it would be fun. It would be cool visiting other planets, you know. If, if it's possible, of course, yes. Of course, I would love to. What's your favorite planet? I'd say Mars. It's my favorite planet. Uh, it has to be Earth, you know. I live in it, so it has to be Earth. How do you feel about Pluto not being a planet anymore? Uh, it doesn't really matter to me. I don't really care about Pluto. It's pretty far away. So, If there were aliens and they came here, um, what do you think they'd be like? Oh, God. I am one of them. Oh, right. Sorry. Yes. I'm so sorry. That was so a stupid you. question. If aliens came to Earth, what do you think they'd be like? <laughs> they might be shapeshifters. Perchance, aliens just may be uh, cat-like beings or beings with bird heads. I don't know. What is this crazy thing? If you stepped onto the moon, what would your first words be? One small step for Dan and giant step for mankind. Is your name Dan? Yeah, yeah. What would you say as you stepped onto the moon? Where did I get on the wrong moon? I wanted to be on Titan. I can't believe I'm here. I'm not Neil Armstrong. <laughs> okay, I'm going to say something and you fill in the blank, okay? In space, no one can hear you. How can you tell? Uh, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for... Quasar kind. Uh, Houston, we have a... A baby. Houston, we have a baby. I love it. We're going to move on to our how obsessed are you question. These are right. questions I ask everybody. I warn okay. you, they are weird. Okay. Do you Bring think it. about space every day? Yes. Excellent. Do you think that... <laughs> If you decided to have a different career, like you're a successful uh, space historian now, but if you were like, you know what, screw it, I'm going to start a punk rock band, would you still think about space every day? Probably, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's in your brain. It's in my brain. It's in your DNA. Yep. Uh, have you ever had a dream about space? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
What are your space dreams like? <laughs> um, they're weirdly always grounded in reality. A <laughs> surprise. Um, no, I've had a f- I've had a few, but there's always, there's one from like years ago that I always kind of end up coming back to, where it's like you go to the. It's almost like that episode of Futurama where they go to the moon and then Fry goes out to go to the real moon. Okay. It's like, but I had this dream way before that show existed, which is super weird. Yeah. But it was like it was like I've been in that situation where I go to like an amusement park or like something on the moon, and then I end up just wandering away and all of a sudden like the atmosphere just disappears there's no bubble it's just like all of a sudden you're just like walking on the moon and then you like take a train back to earth or something like that is a weirdly thing that happens but i've had dreams where all of a sudden i'm just like i'm on the moon now and you can breathe yeah yeah and it's just chill yeah it's it's just like it's like it's like you walk outside you turn a corner and all of a sudden you're just on the moon and then you go back and it's fine it's totally normal Oh, nice in my dream world but it's always like all of a sudden black and white like the old Apollo pictures with like that kind of okay. green tinge and like very very much the same detail as all the images that I spend hours sifting through every day for yeah. various things you know it's that's it's rooted in that research in your dreams really when you're on the moon what do you do do you just kind of hop around and do I usually do just moon kind stuff? of walk around and look at the earth and do exactly what I imagine I would do on the moon which is look at all the rocks and wander around and just explore it a little bit yeah. and stare at the earth a lot it's really awesome that you have yeah. scientifically accurate it's dreams. really weird aside from the breathing thing <laughs> <laughs> have you ever had a dream yeah. that's just grossly scientifically inaccurate and then you just wake up in a cold sweat just mad at your brain for mm, dreaming bad science no I mean I've definitely had like dreams that are physically impossible yeah like yeah like <laughs> like weird like weird dream space things but like no nothing that i'm just like oh come on brain <laughs> self-punch like no not, not, none of that good good <laughs> would you if you could stow away on a spaceship yeah <laughs> what why is it said <laughs> Because I would need to make sure that there would be enough oxygen for me first. Right. Okay. So, yeah. So, let if, me, let me, if consumables were not an issue. Yes. Okay. I, I can't not real science. Oh, my and God. That's fine. That's great. <laughs> I need more real science people yeah. in my life. If yeah. it's okay with you, every once in a while, I might just uh, uh, contact you on Twitter to just say, can you say like a real just science real thing to me? real science, yeah. Because I've been thinking about lightsabers yep. and for too long and I need some real science I can, to ground me I as can a real human. science. Okay. A real science, yeah. So all the real science yeah. works. Yeah, all the real science and consumables are fine. Everything's fine. Maybe I a little would... bit of a moral gray area, but moral, you could sneak on. Moral gray area, I would, I would maybe do it. Okay. I'm very Canadian too, so yes. I feel bad right. overstepping my bounds. I would no. probably like fight real hard to get on there. I'm from the Midwest, which right. also has a lot of shame investment. Yeah. I have been taught shame from a, a young age. But I think there's that thing of do you feel bad enough to stop yourself from doing a thing? Because I feel guilty about saying dumb little things wrong. Yeah. But I've still done morally questionable things in my life because I just want to do them so right. much. Yeah, I don't know. I, I that's that's why the sad yeah, because um, like I really really want to go into space, but I I feel like I'd feel really bad about it. Right, but then sometime In years space? from now, like thirty It'd make years a later, really good story. Exactly, somebody could write about this yeah. fun flawed human who snuck yeah. on board. I don't know, I don't know. Teresa on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Would you get a space related tattoo? Yes. Do you already have one? <laughs> do you want to say any more about that you don't have to all right fair enough uh, no but i absolutely would I've, I've looked at a few designs of things that would be interesting nerdy but still artistic without being like lightsaber okay. <laughs> yeah fair enough yeah would well, what when you say nerdy yeah for that what does that mean for you like like a a math calculation no that would be way too nerdy for me because i don't math Right. Um, but well, you say you don't math, but obviously you understand all of the science to write about it. Yes. So it's, is it just that you can't do it, but you totally understand it once it's done? I could never do the calculation, done? but when I I can I can read. So what what it is is like if you read a scientific paper about something, I can read the abstract. I can read the the English translation of yeah. it, and then translate that into actual English. Okay. So I understand enough about the sort of how the stuff works. But I can, like, I can look at the formulas, you know, if you ever read a paper that's like, and we can see this proof in this calculation. It's just like, and skipping that. Okay. Like, I can't do the numbers, but I understand the concept of it. Right. But you yeah. understand, like, the science, too. Yeah, like, you yeah. Obviously, the, you understand the distances and yeah, the, I, what I, planets are composed I, of and all yeah. that. So, like, I, I understand, you know, how, like, you know, I understand how the moon is going around the Earth and how okay. that works. And I could, I know the distances and all that stuff, but I could never calculate a trajectory to get there. Okay. Because that's way more math than I understand. I know that you have to go to where the moon is going to be in three days because it's moving right but i would not be able to figure that out 
Okay. So yeah, uh, the I mean nerd tattoo. I've been looking at a uh, so ugh, this is really nerdy. The they tried to land the Gemini spacecraft, which was the second generation spacecraft with a paraglider wing. So okay. it's like this two lobe triangular sail, and it was supposed to land on a runway, as supposed to splash down in the ocean, and it was a hundred and sixty five million dollars in nineteen sixty two. Billion. Yeah, it's like 2.1 billion today's dollars. Uh, I wrote my master's thesis about it, and it's awesome. And there's a really great artwork of the landing sequence that, you know how people have like the, the swallows flying up their arm? Yeah. It would look like that, but it would be a landing spacecraft. <laughs> and then would it say fail at the end? And then it would just, no, it would just like the, the last one is like it's touching down with like a puff of, of dust. Okay. How did yeah. it fail? It just it just couldn't work in time. So I mean, you got to remember that like '60s, they were pushing to get Apollo off the ground, yeah. and like everything that was huge. And then adding this thing that like you didn't really need to change the way the Gemini spacecraft landed. Okay. So it was just like it was a pet project by a Canadian engineer actually. Nice. Um, and they just wanted to get this done. Stop employing the Navy. Stop dipping these things in salt water. But it just like it kept failing. It just couldn't, and they just didn't have time or money to really make it work. Well, that'd be really cool then. Yeah, because it's it's obviously so something like, that means a lot to yeah, you. Yeah, it'd be it'd be super nerdy, but still still really artistically interesting and and really personal yeah and we tell a narrative yeah right? so that's that's what i mean when like something nerdy and spacey but that's not okay. just like a like moon exclamation <laughs> point <laughs> i say with the exclamation point on my wrist oh you do uh, have. i do have the little one. Oh, nice. um yeah do you have a question mark no no that's just, it just okay. the exclamation point never nice. never don't be excited about what you do <laughs> is that what that means yeah <laughs> never don't be excited never don't be excited <sighs> Yeah. If you ever recorded a pop song, Never. I think that is a great title for a pop <laughs> because, song. Because all good pop songs have double ne <laughs> double negatives. Oh, they sure do. <laughs> Never don't, Never be, don't excited. be excited. Uh, next question. Would you break up with someone who hated space? Um, No. If it was someone that didn't like space but was interested enough to understand that it was cool to kind of put up with it, fine. Okay. But if it was someone that was just like, I don't care about the moon landing, it was fake anyways, and this is stupid, <laughs> I'd be like, all right, get out. Just get out of my face right now. Um, no, I don't. I mean, I actually I, I actually can't date space nerds. Okay. Because their passion is my work. So okay. then I don't get a break. Oh, really? I, this, this has been like a thing, actually. So you've where, dated like, space I've, nerds I've and just like, dated a couple shut people up, who, I want like, to loves, the Simpsons. Who love space, and it's just like, you're just hanging out, hanging out, and they're just like, so... But the flight rotation for this, I'm just like, I don't know. Don't make me think right now. Like, I've been doing this for 10 hours a day. I want to drink a beer and I want to go listen to some loud music or I want to watch TV and I don't want to think about space. And it's just like, so I, I actually look for people who aren't space people. Okay. Who think it's cool, but don't live it because it's just like, I can't, I need a break. Yeah. <laughs> well, that makes a, a lot of sense. Yeah. That's really so, cool. So, yeah. No, I would not break up with someone. I would break up with someone who thought the moon landings were faked. I think that's good. I think, I think most people should. should break up with someone who thinks the moon landings Absolutely. Were yeah. I almost want to go around. I'm married, but I, yeah. if I were not, I would like to go around and start dating people who think it's fake just so I can break up with them. That would just, be. That's how strongly I feel about it. Maybe I should find somebody and date them and then break up with them on Twitter just to see what my audience would do. <laughs> uh, social experiment? Yeah, yeah. Creating the narrative. Creating the narrative. <laughs> uh, this is the last how obsessed are you question, and it is very weird. If you couldn't write about space without you or someone you love first being punched in the crotch, would you still write about space? <laughs> it's so weird. It really is, but it's very revealing. Well, is it, I mean, is it... Okay, well, first of all, I would prefer to be punched because I okay. wouldn't want to harm anybody that I care about. Um, is it like a single punch or is it like every time I write something, I would have to be punched in the People uh, generally negotiate with me on this and it <laughs> usually comes out to like a monthly thing, like a Netflix subscription. Uh, once a month for like all the month of the writing that I do. As much writing as you want. I'd go with it. I'd go with it. But I'm also a lady. It's going to hurt me less than it would hurt a guy. <laughs> True, but it still hurts, right? It still hurts, yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah. I'd do that. See, I learn a lot about people because usually <laughs> uh, people barter. Right. And then people also sometimes are like, like you just did, well, of course I'd take it. And other yeah. times people would be like, no, my cousin. Like they just, <laughs> they want to give it to somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm too Canadian. I'd have to, I, I, I couldn't put anybody else through that <laughs> would you would you apologize after you got punched in the crunch are you that canadian <laughs> possibly I'm sorry. The, the other day somebody i thought was trying to like get around me at an airport and and i apologized to, to him and i realized that it was just a friend coming over to say hello <laughs> like, my instinct is to apologize all the time okay and can you Real say thing. sorry once sorry okay so that's not an affectation you really say 
it, it in the stereotypically Canadian it's way. It's going to happen now, but the accent does come out every once in a while. Okay. There are some words uh, out and about and house uh, and sorry are the big ones. Okay. And I do say a a fair bit. Okay. Um, that's where the accent is. Cool. It's, I'm just having fun with a Canadian now. I'm sorry. Go team. <laughs> it's fun to hear. <laughs> All right. So can yep. you make a noise to sum up your obsession with space? What noise do you associate <laughs> with your love of space? Um, it's funny because I've actually made this noise on the internet before to sum up my love of space. <laughs> really? That's awesome. <laughs> I have a weird job. Uh, if I had to sum up my obsession in a noise, it would be... <laughs> so how would you describe that noise with words? Is uh, that, uh... Like a really excited squee. Okay. A, a, a squeal of delight? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you're down with the word squee? Yeah. That's okay. Cool. Only cool. sometimes, not all the time. It's a sometimes word, not an every time word. <laughs> that's my favorite like thing I've ever, that's my most rational thing I've ever heard somebody say about squee. It's a sometimes it's word. It's a sometimes word, yeah. Did you say like cookies? Like cookies, yeah. Oh. Remember when Cookie Monster, the whole like Sesame oh, Street's yeah. new branding thing is you can't just eat cookies like Cookie Monster did when, you know, you and I were growing up. Yeah. Uh, now it's cookies are a sometimes food, not an all the time food. That's bullshit. That's so sad. He's a, he's a cookie monster. I know. I know. You're. He should be. He's a monster. He's not a human. <laughs> if it was a human that would just like gorge himself on cookies, I could see making the distinction. Yeah. But like, he's a monster. Yeah, he's not cookie moderate. He's cookie monster. For <laughs> fuck's sake. I love cookie moderate. They just like rebrand him. Oh, God. I can uh, take or leave cookies. Yeah. Fuck sad. you, cookie moderate. <laughs> uh, that's a great noise. So I've been rating people's obsessions. Mm -hmm. So I quantify it as seven. And right. to give it flavor, I give it a space thing. Okay. So uh, black holes out of seven black holes. Okay. Do you like black holes? They're they, they're they kind interesting. Of bore you? No, I just I don't really understand what's going on. I mean, I do kind of understand what's going on. I think they're kind of neat, but it's not like a oh my god, okay. there's a new black hole study. Oh, I'm gonna be up all night. <laughs> you know, I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I stayed up. I stayed up all night reading Harry Potter. I would not stay up all night reading about black holes. Okay, fair enough. So, uh, uh, Titan is the moon you like. Yes. So all right. So out of <laughs> so times. out of seven Titans. <laughs> What is are you doing a prime number for a reason? I just like the number seven. Okay, fair enough. I was born on the seventh, so I'll I'll take the seven. Oh, awesome. Yeah. 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 No, I get that. It's just I did so I did the international baccalaureate, which is like super did you really? Yes, I did. Do you know too. what that is? Oh my god, no one knows what it is. It's scored out of seven. Why is it scored out of seven? That yeah. drove me nuts all through high school. So that's why I always think it's weird when people score out of seven. That's what you were talking about earlier when you were saying that they just wanted you to score well. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I wasn't I had to take math studies. I couldn't take uh, math methods. Yeah. 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 Cause That's I, where I was, and I had to do it standard level because I didn't have, they didn't think I would do well enough to get in. It wasn't about getting into college. It was about the school looking good for the next generation. Yeah. Parents wanting to send their kids there. Yeah, because for people who don't know it, so, you yeah. can graduate from it. And so they introduce this program to schools. You can graduate from it. I think it's an, it's international. Yeah. It's an international program. Yeah. yeah. So when it first came to my school, they were just really like, what if you never slept and took all the classes? Wouldn't yeah. that be cool? Yeah. Like, it nope. was it was six classes plus an elective plus all these other requirement things. But what was so weird is that you can do the IB requirements. Don't I don't know how it works here, but they don't necessarily work with uh, province requirements or city requirements in Canada. So I have an IB math credit, but I don't have a high school math credit. What? That's so nuts. I can't, I couldn't even take science in university. Oh, that's yeah. nuts. Isn't that weird? Yeah. And now I write about this for a living. Yeah, it works out. Yep. Yeah. I'm, I'm good. In the end, I'm good. Yeah. But anyways. <laughs> After I took my English test, my teacher was like, I didn't think you'd score well, but I guess they score on creativity. It was a really back, backhanded compliment. Ah. Oh, but now I do creative stuff. How, high school so teachers are the worst. <laughs> they really they're supposed suck. to like guide you into finding your life path, and ultimately they're like, you're not good at anything, so go paint a picture about your feelings. <laughs> it's just like, what if I paint a picture with my fist? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. All right, so out of seven Titans, yep. prime number, I think that you are six out of seven Titans obsessed. All right, I'll take that. Yeah. It's good to have balance. Yeah, it's good to, yeah, you have just, you have just a sliver of boundaries. <laughs> Where uh, it is clearly yeah. such a huge passion, and it's in your soul, but then you also have this interesting thing where it is your work and you want to turn it off yeah. at a point, which is, I, I honestly, doing this podcast, don't hear that very often. Yep. People are usually like, no, I want it all the time right. because I'm super into it. Right. But that's a really cool. Andre, yeah. how do you feel about that rating? Do you find I, that acceptable? No, I think, I think that's good. I'm actually, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased with that because it's true. I do like I there's no space stuff in my bedroom because I need to not okay. think about work when I sleep. So like there is a very clear division in my life where it's like when I go out, it's not it's not space. OK, we don't know space, space outside. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's true. It's weird. But like I've had to make that distinction because people yeah. are always like you love space here. Take all this space stuff. 
just like I don't I don't need it all the time <laughs> yeah it's the gift yeah. and curse of branding yes. you know yep, people see you that true. way but cool. I, I love it more than I get annoyed about that yeah so, for sure can you uh plug yourself tell people where to find you uh your book yeah yeah my book so all the things okay so my book came out earlier this year it's called breaking the chains of gravity from bloomsbury sigma uh it's about pre-nasa space flight so it's looking at the development of rockets and spacecraft training and all that stuff before there was a nasa um prehistory known to the nerds not known to the normies so i tried to write it <laughs> for the normies um you can also find me online if you google vintage space is probably the easiest way okay. to find me because my name is a little bit hard to spell uh the blog is at popular science called vintage space the youtube channel also called vintage space it's just youtube.com slash vintage space. Uh, I'm on Twitter at AST Vintage Space. Branding. <laughs> um, and also Instagram, same handle, AST Vintage Space. And I'm I'm all kinds of other weird places, but those are the big ones. I'm in like I'm in like four or five TV shows and documentaries that are okay. like being syndicated right now and shows that like I haven't even seen all of and you know, I, I don't even know where half the stuff ends up. I'm like on sci fi and science channel a lot. Oh, cool. And um, American Heroes channel. <laughs> yeah. So it's like I, I pop up in weird places. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And your Twitter is super fun to follow because it is a, a nice break in, at least for me and all the other people I follow, <laughs> of something a little bit different. Yeah. The, the, the Twitter is usually like a daily picture of the moon or something yeah. from Apollo Air that's just like, I found this day and this is awesome. Or here's a weird video that I just discovered. And sometimes just like, go listen to this band that I like right now. <laughs> <laughs> Which it's funny. It's funny how much my audience is just like, uh, like crickets. When, when anything that's not a moon picture goes up, it's just like internet crickets. It's really funny. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it's a lot. It's a lot of just like fun visual stuff. Yeah. Because it's, 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 it's Twitter and I don't take Twitter all that seriously because... Yeah. It's a lot. It's a lot. I can't even look at the news feed anymore. It's just too much. <laughs> oh, and you can also find me on Facebook by my full name, too. Yeah. I have one of those. Yes. I have a professional page with videos that go up. Cool. Yeah. Cool. So plenty of places to find Amy <laughs> Sheeret title. These are the final questions. Mm. They're just weird questions that don't yes. have anything to do with your obsession. Yeah. Would you rather be able to fly or teleport? Fly. Fly. Yeah, for sure. So you just, you want the sensation. I want that sensation. I want to see the horizon. And, right. Yeah. Because it's not for sure. about the destination. It's about, it's about the journey, journey there. Right. Yeah. Nice, nice. If there was a theme park ride based on your life, what would the ride be like? Um, Not a stand-up roller coaster because I'm too short for those, uh, <laughs> but definitely like an old wooden roller coaster that goes way faster than you expect it to. One okay. of those. <laughs> I love those. So it looks... Uh, so it looks good and vintage. Yeah. But it's, you know, you're not going to die, but it actually like whips you up pretty ha pretty pretty high and then you're like going on sideways and it's pretty fun and it's just kind of kind of nuts so it would have a like vintage a classic feel classic roller coaster it would be classic yeah. it would be aesthetically pleasing and you would it would be fun but you feel like you're gonna but die. it would still be it would still be like you know modern roller coasters are like we're the highest the steepest drop it's like sometimes those old wooden ones are just like way faster than you expect because it's just gravity right that that's awesome some of those are like my favorite roller coasters so i'd, I'd want to be my career to be one of those <laughs> <laughs> nice and the final question for everyone on the podcast mm. is what is happiness um to quote charlie brown uh a warm hot dog and a cold coke <laughs> <laughs> that's what comes to mind uh happiness do you like both of those things i or well i'm a vegetarian so a warm veggie dog and a cold coke <laughs> and do you like coke probably diet coke uh yeah but no I, I love charlie brown um happiness is being able to do what you love for a living every day i think that is a great answer i also think the new quote of happiness <laughs> is a warm veggie dog and probably a diet coke is also a great answer to what is happiness Char i think that was from a charlie brown my dad had the Peanuts treasury in his room growing up, which I slept in at my grandmother's house growing up okay. sometimes. And I have it in my apartment now, this old thing from 63. I love that book. <laughs> I love Peanuts. <laughs> <laughs> so happiness is also a yeah. random Peanuts yeah. book. Yeah. There's a lot of vintage in my life. The vintage is like more than just space. It's a lot okay. of 50s Americana in my life. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for doing the podcast. Thank you so much for letting me rant to you for an hour. <laughs> Absolutely. Anytime. That is our podcast. You've been listening to Obsessed. Joseph Scrimshaw and his guest shared some stories with the rest. Rate five stars if you're impressed. Obsessed.
So space bacon is a real thing. Um, I tried to get hashtag space bacon trending on Twitter once. It really didn't work out well. Um, of all the food the Apollo astronauts took to the moon, one of their favorites unanimously across the board was bacon cubes and I, or bacon squares. And I don't really know what they are, but I'm just imagining like compressed bacon in a cube. And I don't know if it's because the air was dry in there and it was salty and it really tasted good, but every single mission talks about bacon squares like you have the transcripts from inside the crew and they're just they're just chatting they're like you know oh pass me that turkey oh rehydrate that wait where are my bacon cubes and they're just like really get incensed about bacon cubes and they're like bartering their bacon cubes for puddings and stuff and it's just like it always comes down to bacon squares um so i tried to get when i first discovered that i think it was in apollo 8 that they talk about it and like every mission mentions it i went through all the transcripts and actually pulled out all the references to space bacon and i wrote an article about hashtag space bacon <laughs> <laughs> the the weird stuff is my favorite. <laughs>